Afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session, Action Through Allyship. We're here ultimately to celebrate Black History Month, which is observed in the UK during October as an annual remembrance and celebration of the history, achievements, and contributions of Black people in the UK. As I've just mentioned, the theme for today's event is Action Through Allyship. And to help us explore exactly what is meant by this, I'm proud to be joined with two CAs, along with Clive Bellingham, who's a deputy president of ICAS and an ally for Ziversity. So before we get started, let me just go into a few housekeeping things. Um, first of all, we want this to be an interactive session. We want you to be able to participate with the speakers. If you like what you hear, we want to hear from you. And so what you will find uh, is a live Q&A feature on this platform which can be accessed via the right hand side of your screen okay and through that you can submit questions at any point in time and we'll try as best as we can to incorporate those questions during the session if they don't sort of naturally fit into where we are in terms of our talking point then we'll take those questions at the end but the aim is to be able to uh, interact with the things that you're saying and and um, tackle those questions during the session you will also find, I believe, a discussion forum feature as part of this platform. Uh, and again, you'll find this towards the right hand side of your screen. And what this will allow you to do is to comment and discuss with fellow attendees on the matters that have been covered uh, during this webinar. Two other things, uh, this will be recorded, so you should be able to access the recording afterwards. Uh, and lastly, everyone on this webinar is automatically muted. Uh, so you don't have to worry about background noise wherever you are. You can kind of just kick back, uh, listen in, and kind of just participate in, in, in what you hear. So a couple of things I need to address up front. Um, my name is Kudzai Zendera. You may have been expecting Martha to be um, moderating this session, but unfortunately she's had a last, uh, an unexpected unavailability. So I'm going to step in and, and cover that role for her, but I assure you, you will still be in good hands. So before I pass over kind of for an introduction to our speakers, let me just kind of set the scene slightly. So over the past few years, I think we would all appreciate that recognizing and tackling racial inequality has rightly uh, received increased attention, but it's not always obvious how we can be part of the solution. So really what we want to do over the next hour is use this time to just explore today's topic, what is allyship, why it's important, and crucially, the contribution that we can all make to champion diversity and inclusion and equality through allyship. So this really is designed to just give everyone some takeaway that they can apply in their personal and professional lives in order to make a real contribution um, in this space. So what I'm gonna do at this point is I am now going to hand over to each of our speakers to give themselves a brief introduction so you know who they are and who you're gonna be hearing from. And once we're done with that, I think we can delve kind of into, into the Q&A for today's discussion. So if I hand over, if we go in the order of uh, Clive Temi Tosin, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, that would be great. Yeah, thanks, Katai, uh, thanks for introducing me, um, welcome. I'm Clyde Bellingham. I am currently the deputy president uh, at ICAS. Um, I spent some 37 years with PwC working in Scotland, Saudi Arabia and Switzerland, where I, I now live. And for the last eight years of my time at PwC, I was on their global governance board. Uh, so uh, looking forward to today's discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Temi Labo. I am an associate director within um, the Forensic Risk Alliance firm, the Dubai practice. I, um, I like to describe myself as I'm a Nigerian British accountant with over 15 years of experience in the corporate world. I've always worked in the mid, mid sized to large organization, and my career started off in the UK with a big four um, and then moved to Dubai in the Middle East region with a national bank. And now I'm back to consulting with um, 
at a small international private boutique, boutique consulting firm. And I am looking forward to be on the panel today. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Tosin Ajayi. I'm based in, in London, in the UK. I work with Shell and I head up corporation tax for Shell's downstream businesses uh, in, in the UK. I've been with Shell now for five years. Uh, before this role, I mean, I worked, I worked in the transfer pricing team in Shell, leading up Shell's formerly known as aviation, bitumen, sulfur, and fleet solution businesses. Before Shell, I was with Ernst & Young, and I worked with Ernst & Young for four and a half years, where I was in the international tax and transfer pricing team as well. I actually started my career in Nigeria, in Lagos, where I worked with KPMG, um, I worked with KPMG for two and a half years. I qualified in 2007 um, in Nigeria and also um, joined, uh, became an, a, a member of ICAS in 2016. Um, and I look forward to the conversations that we'll, we'll be having shortly on, on allyship. And I guess it's just left for me to introduce myself. So my name's Kudzai Zendera. I'm a director at Standard Chartered Bank. I work in our liquidity function, um, which sounds technical, but it's it's not that much. So uh, I began my career with PwC. So that's who I qualified with, and that's who I sat and passed my ICAS um, exams with. So awesome, great. Thank you everyone for kind of providing that introduction. Thanks also to someone in uh, the discussion forum who has already engaged with the feature with a kind of nice positive remark. So if everyone can kind of replicate that energy and enthusiasm, it would be fantastic. So look, I think a logical place for us to start, right, is by defining what it is that we're here to talk about. And let's see if kind of we all have the same understanding of what we mean by allyship. So I guess the first question I'm going to ask, and I'll direct this to, I guess, Clive and Temi, uh, if we'll go with Clive first, is what does allyship mean to you and why is it important to you? Let's go Clive first, please. Yeah, sure. I, I think, you know, two aspects. I mean, firstly, there's a sort of, you know, definition of allyship, which is, you know, someone who's, who's not a member of a, a marginalized group, but who wants to support and take action to help others in that group. Um, and I think the, the other aspect of it is, is really this, my own personal view that, you know, we rarely work alone. We typically work in teams and those, those teams involve a number of individuals, all from different backgrounds, different nationalities, et cetera, often cross border, certainly from my own experience working with PwC globally. And it's, it's, it's how you make that team, um, both diverse, um, but perhaps more importantly, inclusive and, and there's the sort of equality within that team. And as a leader, keeping in mind, you know, how you can support people who are perhaps at coming from different environments, having different experiences, having different maturity profiles to fully contribute and feel um you know comfortable within that environment okay okay so what i'm picking up there i'll come to you shortly timmy but i think to, what i'm taking from that answer really is the fact that as you said we are we are a collective right we don't work alone how can we as part of teams as parts of groups and people whether that's in work or in society how do we bring ourselves together essentially right and that's why it's important to you and if i yeah. hopefully for the listeners you'll find me trying to kind of recap and pull out the main uh, what i would call nuggets from each answer so <laughs> tell me you, yourself please um okay so i think with that question i actually always break it down into three so i guess the first one is what or who is an ally and kind of based on what clive had said an ally is defined as a person that actively promotes or aspire to advance the culture of inclusion. Um, 
my definition of an ally is usually someone of privilege. And I don't mean wealth or well-educated, but it's generally someone in a position that's different to others. So whether it's a position of power or a dominated industry or gender roles. Um, so for example, a man can be allied to women, um, able-bodied people can be allies to those with different abilities. So for me, that's like the definition of what who an ally is. Then the next question, which is kind of what you asked, is sort of an allyship. I see an allyship as a as a journey. It's a journey um, of relationship with with two people or multiple people, but um, it's something that's not that's built over time. It's not developed overnight. And and I think what I love to always bring in when I use the word allyship is that work and effort must be recognized by whoever's on both sides, I guess. So whoever's willing to be someone's ally, they must understand the work that's required for them. So that's kind of like my definition of ally, of who an ally is and the allyship. In terms of why is it important, um, for me and generally, I think when you are in a position of minority, you need help. And I guess you need help from the right place to kind of get ahead. So I see it's important for me because I feel like it's very similar to mentors. You know, you need someone to be able to guide you. The difference in this case is that an ally is mindful of your limitation and your challenges that you're facing as a result of whether it's ethnicity or gender. So kind of coming back to the mentor similarity again, is with a mentor, it's easier because you have a performance guide and it could be you have weaknesses and things you can work on. With an ally, it's slightly different because these are things you can't control. So I'm, I'm a black woman, I can't change that. So it's working with someone that understands that and know that the challenges I'm facing has nothing to do with my performance but just who I am. So for me, that's why it's important, is understanding that in order to be able to get ahead, especially when you are in, uh, when you're a minority, whether it's a male dominated environment or just different race, when you're in that position, you need people to speak up for you and support you when you're there, and most importantly, behind your back. So that's my answer. <laughs> um, Thank you. I think that's very helpful. And I think that's um, kind of brings in some similar themes. There's similar themes across both of your answers, right? The, the, the one word that has come up more than once is inclusion. OK, so that's clearly a thing. That's clearly a central objective. And I think working together. Tell me what I quite liked from your answer and that I'd pick out is the fact that you mentioned you likened it to mentorship, which I think we can all relate to, but a journey over time, which implies, and I'm sure the conversation will explore this, some willingness to engage on both sides, okay? So both within, if you like, the minority group and both within, yeah. both uh, sort of from the allies. So I think we'll, we'll, the, the conversation at some point, we'll look at what we can all do, uh, no, no matter what camp you're in, but I think that's, uh, that's, that's important to pick out. Okay, so if we look at, we now have kind of a bit of more of an understanding of what it is and why it's important. Um, it would be interesting to explore in a bit more detail kind of how allyship has featured um, in each of our careers. Um, and I guess and we'll come to perhaps Tosin with the second question, but just with the first one, just quickly, because Clive sort of we've, you know, identified you as someone who's kind of on the side of being an ally, right? So I think it's quite, I'd quite like to get your perspective from this question in terms of how you have managed to demonstrate allyship through your career that's the first part and the second part is for anyone who's kind of wanting to become an ally but just thinking I, I don't really know what this is about is it a safe space for me how do i get involved what would you recommend as kind of the first step that someone can take to becoming an ally so how you've demonstrated it within your career and the first step that someone can take towards becoming an ally right I'll maybe take that in reverse order. Um, yep. You know, the sort of first step. Um, 
that's not it's not so easy and I, I wouldn't say that there was a sort of aha moment where I suddenly thought oh you know I want to be an ally <laughs> to somebody or some group of people it's something that evolved from being involved with many sort of international teams you know and working cross-border um you know, my first step outside Scotland was to go directly to, to Saudi Arabia, which was a big leap for me coming from a small village in Scotland to a very multicultural in, environment where you have almost every nationality you can think of working in, in Jeddah. Um, notably, it was very male dominated, um, you know, given the, the landscape in Saudi Arabia at that time. But I think you, you, you sort of immerse yourself in that and then you, you realize that you had lots of people around you who had different backgrounds, different skill sets, um, uh, different values. And that's, that's quite an important thing as well. And, 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 and you, you sort of work out for yourself, or at least I was fortunate enough to work out for myself that, you know, to, to get the most from this team of people, you had to make sure that you, you get them on board, right? And they feel comfortable in that environment. I mean, I, I remember a notable meeting when I when I was in India, actually, I, I traveled to India a lot. And I was at their governance board, and there were six Indian males and one Indian female. And at one point, the Indian female partner said to me, you know, you do realize that all of these guys around the table, they just accept everything you say, because you're a white because you're a white guy, you know? And I thought about that a lot afterwards and talked to her and, and, and accepted that. I mean, she had a point that I needed to listen to that, you know, wasn't so obvious to me. And therefore you then sort of start to modify your behaviors as a result of that sort of feedback. Um, and, and on your first question, I would say, you know, when I first came to Switzerland, again, very international environment, but very male dominated, still is to a large extent, frankly. Um, and there was an initiative launched called Advance to promote gender diversity. And there was a partner from WC at the time who asked me to get involved in the, the cross company mentoring program that they had. And I, I agree with the comments that Timmy had about mentoring and, and I, I liked I like the sort of mentoring because it's also a two way thing, you know, that, um, but I got involved in that. And then at one point I realized that, uh, when they formed advance, the entire board was female. So, and that was perhaps obvious in terms of the initial conception of the idea, but then I went to Joanne and said, I mean, you can't continue with an all female board, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the whole purpose of this is diversity. Um, and to give Joanne credit, she said to me, yeah, that's fine. I'll step down and you can join the board. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll do that, right? And that's the aspect of our leadership of sort of looking out for opportunities or, or even just subconsciously thinking that there are things out there that you may pick up on. And the minute you do, you actually need to try to think about what you can do about them. So, you know, what I'm going to, what I'm picking up there, particularly from your last bit is there is, there is an aspect of this, which is about being intentional with what you see and being proactive with what you see. So it's kind of, you know, observing differences is one thing, but where you feel that actually it's a difference in which it, you're observing a difference in which you could make a positive change. It's about having some intentional, um, I was going to say intentional intent. Does that even make sense? Let me just say some in positive intent to make a, a change in that space, right? Right, okay. right. Okay, yeah, awesome. No, now, absolutely. Okay, now, conscious that I've left uh, our third speaker patiently kind of silent up until now, which is not at all, not at all intentional. So let me bring this question to you, Tosin, and apologies that it's uh, I've taken so long to kind of uh, involve you in the discussion, but um, from your perspective, have you benefited directly from allyship or to take the question a bit broader than that, in case the answer is no, I guess it would be, 
have you have you seen allyship in action or kind of you know have you benefited it have you seen it in action if you haven't directly benefited from it and uh yeah let me leave it there before uh, sort of spanning that question anymore thank you could say and i have benefited and i have seen it um I'll give some examples to illustrate this. So last year, just when we were coming out of the pandemic, actually two years ago in 2022 now, in 2020, you know, just towards the end and, and we were in coming out, actually, we were in the heat of the pandemic, but there was a lot of everyone's working from home, um, you're on calls, you're not visible as such to stakeholders like you would have been if you were in the office. And then we had Black Lives Matter, there was the Me Too movement. And as part of that, one of the actions taken, and I speak for myself and I don't speak for Shell, but one of the actions taken by the organization was we need to be, be we need we need to step up, you know, on, on what we do about our black members, our black employees. Um, and one of the again as we say allyship it's it's not just words it's actions but one of the things that came out of of shell's commitment was um mentoring uh black individuals black employees black members uh there were a number of other themes as well that shell had but something that a senior leader then did was to take this a bit forward she reached out to me um, and asked if i wanted to join the Talent Accelerator Program of the Black British Business Award. Now, what they are, what that program would do is help Black employees or Black members to understand how the workplace works. What do you need to do about workplace politics? Do you even know that you have workplace politics? How can you navigate this to excel? You know, and also, what do you do to help the white counterparts or other people you'd work with to be able to appreciate what you offer, what you've got to give, um, how do you get feedback, and essentially is how to just navigate such that you can progress in the workplace, such that your contributions are recognized and there's not so much focus on your on the color of your skin. So the fact that that senior leader put me forward for the program and she was committed to ensuring that I got something out of it. I mean, to me, I think that's what allyship is, because allyship is, you know, you recognize there is an issue um, and then you prefer solutions because you can prefer solution if you don't know there's an issue. So you have to have done some research. You have to know that there is something wrong and then you, you, you give solutions. And besides that, um, in in my workplace as well, I've got other senior members that are keen to understand what's going on, uh, what, what am I finding, you know, in in the organisation. There was a bit of a reverse mentoring uh, opportunity I had as well, where that individual would ask me questions that you know you can only discuss in forums like this. And, and an example of that question was. What do you think about being called a black employee? The word black, are you comfortable with it? So, you know, it's asking questions that uh, uh, other employees would not ask you day to day, perhaps, or a senior leader would not just call you up and ask you. But he was asking, what am I finding? Have I experienced microaggressions in the workplace? Do I think that I'm not getting as much opportunities as others are getting? So. Uh, and 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 for me, that you know just shows that uh, I have that person, and and what I call an ally again is someone who is genuine, someone who is ready to listen and committed. So I had the questions being asked genuinely, just because you know the the, the person wanted to understand and also help. And Timmy, as you said earlier, someone who is in a, a black minority, they need help, and that's what it is. That's the reality. So I had the the conversations and and interactions which allowed them to ask questions and was they were ready to listen as well to what I had to say. And again, it's a two-way thing, you know, not only would I expect that somebody else is doing everything, but I also had to commit as well. I had to ensure that I was working on that relationship and 
and make myself trustworthy as well. So all that is what I've experienced and I continue to do. So answering your question, could I, have I experienced the, uh, have I, uh, sorry, I don't think I have your exact words anymore, but have I had an ally or do I have an ally? Yes, I do. Um, and because it's a continuing uh, uh, engagement, uh, some of the allies I have, I continue to interact with them. We continue to go through what I might see in my career, what more do I have and pushing me to achieve my potential. And not only have I seen this for myself, but I hear of other black colleagues that are having discussions like this as well, you know, being put forward in, in different capacities to help them progress. Because it, what happens uh, sometimes is we, we all have bias, we have our bias. And that bias then might mean someone who could have done a particular piece of work and got that recognition and progressed to the next, you might not get that because uh, the, the lead or, or the senior in charge or, or the, the, the director or whatever they're called, the, whatever the designation, designation is, has engaged someone who looks like them, you know, but by then having an, an ally or a sponsor or mentor to step in for you, it helps you progress. So yes, I, I, I see this with, with others and, and I have experienced it as well. Okay. I think, you know, we kept you waiting, but I think the answer you've just given has shown it was well, it was well worth the wait. Uh, we've had a question as well in the chat, which is quite directly related to some of what's just been said here. And something we're going to come on to so i might just pause that question for now but it's it's been it's been noted so i have seen it if anyone else uh has anything that they want to ask or comment on please do use the chat function even if it's just so that we know it's definitely working even if you want to tell me where you're going on holiday next even that's fine all right but just coming back to you tosin so i liked you know again some of what you said there i take it to be and we will touch on this things that are happening both at an organizational level in terms of Shell created a platform to listen, understand what's happening on the ground and then act. And also some benefits you've had at an individual level. You mentioned reverse mentoring, which is, it doesn't exist in all organizations, but you have been able to use as a platform for developing that allyship. And there was something that you said um, in particular, which I, I, I've picked up on, which was, through that reverse mentoring, you've essentially ended up with someone who is just interested and willing to listen. And I think, you know, one of the things that we we talked about um, earlier in this conversation in terms of what you look for in an ally and what it means to people and how people can get involved, uh, Clive, we asked about, you know, kind of how you've demonstrated it is actually taking an interest in people and being willing to listen is probably something that we can all do, right? And Actually, if allyship starts from actions as simple as that, just taking an interest in people and then listening to what they have to say. And then to Clive, one of the things that you said was, if you hear something that you think, actually, I can make a positive difference in that space, acting on it, I think that's something that we can all do to help kind of promote allyship. So I think thank you for, for that um, example. Um, what I'm going to do now is... I'm going to kind of ask, I'll take this one perhaps to Temi, uh, but if, if anyone else wants to kind of supplement the answer, please do. So in your, in your career so far, um, I guess, have you faced kind of challenges, which I would say are unique to either you as an individual, not you as an individual, <laughs> you as a, you know, your gender or ethnicity, right? Where, you know, what kind of, I guess, what challenges have you faced that are unique to your gender or ethnicity? How have you dealt with them? Because I guess that's interesting to know, but bringing it to the theme of this conversation, <laughs> do you think that there's any of those challenges, unique challenges that you might have faced where allyship would have helped? You know? Oh, that's quite an interesting one with the way you ended it. Um, in terms of challenges, actually, so I think... So I'm currently based in Middle East, um, where, and I think back to what Clive said earlier on, back in the days where the landscape within the Middle East is more driven waves of, you would see more men. 
Um, so I moved to Middle East about eight years ago and the challenges I faced when I first joined, obviously coming from London where my abilities and meeting people were like my, it was based on my performance, right? So going to a different country where I'm, it's when I go into meetings, I'm always with like, if I'm of a, a male can't, a male peer or even a male junior staff, um, assumed to be the junior person. So I've had situations where we walked in into a client office and the client just ignored me, started talking to my, um, to the guy I was with. And then onto the guy was like, oh, I'm sorry, I actually can't answer that or you need to speak to my boss. So the challenges I faced, and I think over the time, equality um, is becoming something, you know, it's becoming a big deal in Middle East was around being a woman. So being a woman and being in a senior position, let alone being a black woman. So, so in terms of, and I'll come back to your question, uh, have I been where I feel like an ally could have helped? Um, the struggle I faced and what that had led to is the constant questioning of myself. So walking into a meeting room and it's full of either white male or just other minority, but I'm the only one. Usually, I'm usually the only black person in the room. And in most cases, the only black woman. So that's led to a lot of um, sort of doubting myself and questioning whether I belong here. So those are the sort of, I feel like, the emotional challenges that comes in when you walk into a room and there's no one else that looks like you or no one else that understands you. Um, and then kind of move back to the slide journey. And I know, so I got an ally. I think the first time I started using an ally was probably about three, four years ago when I was being positioned for um, a senior role and I was mindful of office politics, like, um, like Tosin mentioned, as well as just how I present myself. So I reached out to people that I know that I was comfortable with and I got an ally there. And that really helped because they understand the systematic inequalities and they helped me navigate around that. Where an ally could have helped me would have been more in the earlier stage of my career. So maybe the earlier stage when I first moved to UAE, so about eight years ago, where it was difficult. I was trying to navigate around the culture, navigate around an environment where I'm always questioning myself and navigate with office politics as we always do. But I felt like those times were quite challenging because there wasn't anyone willing to stand up and kind of speak for you on your behalf. Um, and I think people kind of shy away from, oh, I don't want to be seen as the only person speaking up. So yes, um, an ally would have helped my career significantly or even just help me develop and understand because it's not always about just the career and sometimes there are things that we need to work on. And I think that's also the point of an ally, right? Someone that's able to have those candid conversations with you. But I felt like through the mid years of my of my career journey, I didn't have that. It was only more in the last three years. And then, and then one of the things I wanted to point out, and I know we've kind of talked about the ally and we talked about it from work, there's also benefit in having allies outside of your organization. So just generally, just generally people that maybe you have worked with before and you've moved past. So it's building that relationship and someone that's able to kind of speak on your behalf, even though you're not in the organization. So to kind of give an example, I currently work for um, Forensic Risk Alliance and I actually got the job because someone acted as an ally for me. It was someone I had worked with years ago and I just reached out, oh, Timmy, I knew you were looking, there's this opportunity. And it was just that kind of understanding that it doesn't always have to be people you work with right now, but also someone outside of your outside of your corporate environment or your career, but just someone that can help you um, in identifying opportunities and helping you grow. So yes, it would have helped my career years ago, but, um, but now I feel like I understand 
what is required and I'm able to put the work in. So yeah, it came at the right time. Okay, awesome. Well, that kind of uh, is a double tick for me because it answers the question that I was going to ask you as well around whether you had benefited from allyship <laughs> also to get your perspective. Uh, so you have, right? But to your point, I think, um, as you said, it helps to have allies within and outside of um, kind of the organization, which I'd link to, I know this is not a career <laughs> discussion, but people often talk about the power of networks. And sometimes you hear the, the word, the phrase, it's a bit corny, but you know, your net worth is your network or your network is your net worth. I think is that one, your network is your net worth. Uh, and to that point, right, I guess this is a bit similar. You never know, I guess you wouldn't have known that an ally was going to help get you to where you've just managed to get yourself to, right? Of yes. course, there's, there's your own kind of competence that's played a part in that as well, but it helps. So I think that's, um, that's interesting. I think the thing that you say about kind of the unique experience of being a woman, I know this is a conversation centered in Black History Month, but I think clearly that is something that a lot of people will be able to identify with whatever your race or ethnicity is, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Being in an environment where you are not kind of the, 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 the dominant representation, whether that's your skin color, your religion, your gender. So I think, um, within that answer is something that we can all take away and and uh, and apply um so i want to ask something shortly about this working at an organizational level but i want to first you know we, we've kind of talked about what allyship is we've talked about how allyship has featured in each of our careers so far okay now i want to talk around about promoting allyship and i want to tackle this part of the conversation at both uh an individual level but also an organizational level so i guess the first one um from an individual level um and i'll ask i guess clive and tosin because clive you've been an ally tosin you've you've spoken about uh receiving the benefits of allyship as well as temi so should people be nervous about becoming an ally and where people are nervous or feel some type of impediment how can we help to remove those barriers so let me start with you clive first uh, perhaps with how people, um, you know, if people should be nervous about it uh, and how we can remove the barriers and then toast. And if there's something you'd like to follow up with, uh, having been the beneficiary of one, you've probably gone through that period of breaking down barriers as well to make it work. It'd be interesting to hear what you have to say. Yeah, you know, when I first came to Switzerland a few decades ago, um, I was actually asked by the UK firm to attend a, a, a management presentation by the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra in Zurich. And this presentation was to a, a women's business club. And the idea was I, I was to go along and see whether PwC UK would be interested in potentially engaging with the conductor on some management training. So I went along and there was roughly 200 women and there were two males. One, one was the conductor of the Boston <laughs> Philharmonic Orchestra <laughs> uh, and, and there was me. And to be kind of, I mean, I was extremely nervous to go into, you know, that, that was a very different environment for me to enter. And so I was the nervous one. What, what was amazing was I think how receptive the audience were, individuals in the audience were, to the fact that I was the only guy and I was probably nervous. And so the best thing to do was to engage with me and talk to me and make me feel comfortable, right? And the reason I tell you that is it's kind of the reverse side of the question, you know, should we be nervous? Well, think about how nervous I was going into that and what the response was from allies, people who sensed that and thought, he's here, we should make him feel at home, right? And be curious, you know, why am I here and all the rest of it. And, and I, I learned a great deal from that. Um, and as uh, Timmy was telling her story about, you know, going into a room and being, say, the, the only female, being the only black female, if I was in that room and you walked in, I would go and introduce myself to you. 
because I remember what it was like for me for that one, one occasion, right? And I know this happens probably more to you than it did to me, but I learned from that experience. And I think that sort of then made me much more conscious about helping others in that type of environment. The, the, other, the other trick I used to do um, was actually at some PwC conferences is, you know, you'd come down for drinks before dinner and all the rest of it. And then there'd be groups of guys talking to each other and there'd be groups of girls talking to each other, right? And I would go up to the groups of girls and say, I'm here to improve the gender diversity of this group. <laughs> and then just engage with them, right? Um, and, and it was, maybe not for all of them, but it was partly breaking the ice by being an ally to them and making them more comfortable in the room. So it, it's perhaps less about your own nervousness and more about being receptive to the nervousness of others. That's really, that's, uh, I like that. <laughs> Particularly the, the, the last part that you said there, because um, that is something I feel quite strongly about in terms of it being a two-way uh, street. Uh, and we all have a responsibility and we're, get, we're gonna tackle that a bit later on, but Tosin, I just want to see if there's Absolutely. something you Absolutely, to... and yeah, I think it's just being mindful, remembering that it's a two-way street. Um, as someone on the receiving end, you know, if you're not approachable as well, you know, and, and you don't put in the effort, then you don't get anything out of it. So, um, I mean, Clive has gone over whether or not uh, an ally should be nervous, but what I would add is um, that willingness to to engage, you know, and and it's it's we're humans at the end of the day. We would not get it right the first time, but remembering that this is a human relationship, you know, you're trying to achieve something, you're trying to help, and putting that effort in. I think that's what should be at the back of people's minds, um, and and that's what would help, you know, that allyship and and the relationship that you're you're trying to to build. Okay, and I think look at this. I think this brings us quite nicely into. The question that we have in the chat as well, which is around um, kind of the organizational uh, side of this. Give me a moment while I bring that question back up. Uh, if you see me smiling, it says my work platform has booted me off <laughs> the Q&A, so it's disappeared right and back. Right, so the question is, it says, what's, um, as a panel, what suggestions do we have to help people move from being individual allies to creating an organization that is a collective ally. Now, I don't mind, I've had some time to think about this, so I'm gonna start with this answer, if I can do. Um, and I think there's a, there's a couple of things, right, for me, um, in terms of what can happen at an organizational level. Now, I'll speak from personal experience as well, some of which uh, you've, you've suggested in your answers already to the questions that have been asked. I think when it comes to organization, it's really about, um creating an atmosphere for allyship to flourish okay and so by that there is an element that involves an organization listening to what its people have to say and i think that's more of a feature now than it perhaps was say five years ago right i think it's really important for people to listen and obtain feedback from the people who work for them see what the prevailing themes are coming out. But really, I think it's normalizing that creation of an atmosphere, normalizing that safe space for people to go and have conversations around the types of topics that perhaps they ordinarily wouldn't do, okay? And a simple thing here is a lot of uh, organizations, large ones in particular, have employee resource groups that exist for different things, be that gender, be that race, religion, um, different age groups, etc. And actually, within those groups, you get a lot of ideation, you get a lot of expression of kind of what's right and what's wrong, but you also get a lot of ideas being shared. And I think if HR functions can also plug into the heart of those employee resource groups, rather than having them exist as an island, that's a great way for uh, affecting it and embedding change. The second part is, 
look, it's great. Organizations can hear what they want to hear, but if no one really cares for what they're hearing, then nothing's going to happen, right? So there is also a part of once you've heard there's a problem, you really have to decide how hard you want to work to try and fix it and change it. Uh, and there's a number of ways of doing that. But, you know, one of the ways is making it part of people's kind of formal objectives, having a balanced scorecard of objectives of which DNI and diversity sits as one of them. I think that's a, you know, that that's a great way of of embedding the change. So making it an objective, making it measurable, making it part of how people are rewarded and appraised. We often hear it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. So I think for me, those things, but particularly normalizing the discussion for staff, creating the safe space and the environments for people to to engage. We used to have our CEO, group CEO, come in and listen sometimes when we were having these meetings. Just You wouldn't even necessarily always know he was there. He would just be a kind of silent participant, but just picking up the messages. I think for me, that's something I've seen help um, create the right culture at an organizational level. But if anyone wants to add, but I'm going to say one, because I think we've got 10 minutes. Uh, and I've got some closing remarks to add in the last few. So let's just go with one person first. I'll go with whoever's smiling the most. <laughs> right. That's, that's going to be indicative of the person who wants to answer. So off you go. I'm not going to choose. Okay, I, I, I'll just jump in here. Tell me if you don't mind. I see you're smiling as well. <laughs> um, I, I completely agree with you, uh, Kutsai. It has to be a tune from the top. And it has to be a continuous effort. I think that's just the other thing. It's not just the uh, once, once and for all, we've got these actions, that's it. It has to be continuously brought up for everyone in the organization. And it's not just for the black people that are involved, but it has to be for everybody, you know? So things like awareness sessions, training mm -hmm. sessions, you know, and like you say, scorecard, it could be like the, the regular, um, uh, something similar to, to independence or, 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 or fraud trainings that an organization might do. So just raising it as, bringing that up so that people don't forget, you know, this is what we're committing to. These are questions that we have for you. Are you doing this or are you? do you have this in mind? But especially being a tone from the top, because that then cascades it to everyone in the organization. Awesome. And uh, I forgot to add one thing to my answer. I think plugging into employee resource groups is great, right? There's, often, there's, there's a great contingent of people who are also willing to volunteer. They have a great passion for these things and they really want to help. But the one thing I would say is don't put it all on those individuals to deliver the change that you want to see. So recognize the work and the effort they're doing, but support them. Don't leave it all for the employee resource group to deliver, is what I would say. Now, this question, unfortunately, I mean, Clive, you, you may feel able to answer, but you may see in a moment why that may not be the case. So this is mostly, I guess, for Temi and Tosin. As a black individual or ethnic minority, what single action can you take to help promote allyship? Because we've talked about what the organization can do and what people can do to help us, I use the collective term, us, but what can you do as an ethnic minority to help promote allyship? And let's go with Temi first. <laughs> That's fine. Um, and think this kind of ties back to what I was trying, what I was going to say for the previous question. So I think as an individual, for me as a black woman, what I do is being an ally for someone else. Um, and in this case, it doesn't necessarily have to be a non-black um, person. One thing that I'm currently working with is coming back to my definition of allies. And in terms of it's someone in a different position. So I'm I consider myself to be in a more sort of senior position with years of experience. So a lot of what I do now is actually being a life and coaching sort of someone just starting off with their career and kind of helping them navigate and how to deal with whether it's all its office politics or just, just even their emotions. Because sometimes they, we face these challenges and we're not sure how to manage them in a professional way. So that's a lot of what I've been doing. Um, it's been ally for other people, more people that sort of slightly junior in my case. And then the other thing I wanted to add on, which organization as well as yourself can do, is calling out inappropriate behaviors. So I feel like 
a lot of organizations have this um, diversity and inclusion initiatives that both Yukuta and Tosin have talked about. But like, this is about action. Sometimes you're in meetings and someone would make an inappropriate comment to whether it's a black woman. It could be anything. It could be, oh, you look nice today or your hair looks different. And I feel like being an ally actually means calling them out rather than kind of going back to going back and think, okay, I'm going to fill out the form. Just call them out. It doesn't have to be done in a malicious way. It could be done in a in a nice way where you just kind of educate them. But remember, if someone's a minority or they're underrepresented, they are not comfortable to speak up for themselves. So in addition to all the initiatives that we have, um, I think it's just when I see things that doesn't make sense or, thing, or someone says something that's inappropriate, I tend to call it out there and there. So that would be the things that I do to help out. Thanks, Timmy. And, and again, I echo some of what you've said. What I would say is be that example you want to see. And certainly, like you've said, you know, when you're in a place, you have a meeting, you're in a gathering, you observe something, speak about it. Mm -hmm. And then not only do you speak, but when you see that someone is struggling as well, be the one that reaches out. Don't just wait back when you know you can reach out, mm -hmm. you know. So in the organization that you've got junior people or people in your level, or maybe some, someone senior, but you see that they're going through something uh, clearly from, from what you can, you can tell, then be that person that reaches out, just like you'd want an ally to reach out to you as well. And when you call something out or when you're giving that feedback, remember that we're humans and this is a, a relationship where we get we might get it wrong but we continue that journey until we get it right you know and, and that's what it is i think that's really oh go on clive go on please i am i'm going to try to address your question all right hey, well listen it, it's 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 fine please do because I, my thinking is you know my wife is anglo-indian so she's she's brown and I would credit her uh, to a large extent with helping me to understand what white privilege is. And I think a lot of white people, particularly a lot of white males, haven't really sort of had to address that they have that privilege and how it can actually be, you know, a force for good in terms of accepting you're in a privileged situation as a white individual and therefore how you could use that to help others to be the ally of others who are not in such a privileged situation but that first step for, for particularly for white males is to understand that they do have a privileged situation typically um and that you know understanding it and sort of thinking through how it could be you know a force for good I think is something that uh, can be, you know, can be powerful, can be something meaningful. And with the organizations, you know, will play well to, you know, purpose and values within the organization. Okay. I'm just going to add one thing to this, because I think one, one of the things I think we can do is, you know, we talked about organizations making it a self space. I think we as black individuals or minority uh, groups can do the same thing. So understand that actually for a lot of people, it can be a scary topic to step into. Even asking the question like, can I call you black is scary. And therefore within the conversations that we're having, I think we need to allow the latitude for people to express something clumsily to maybe get something wrong without kind of biting their head off, so to speak, right? It's allowing it, like you said, this this thing is a journey that, and it's a relationship that needs to be cultivated. You have to leave the room for that to take place now i'm conscious of time so we've got two minutes left i'm going to ask everyone on the line if they can hang on for an extra five okay i just want to go to the speakers for a closing remark okay i'm going to ask two two questions uh one for temi you can think about this and then i'll throw the other ones to, to the, the remainder is what single message you want to give to anyone uh, wanting to be an ally or seeking allyship and perhaps the Clive and Tosin would be 
what single action you think ICAS can take to help promote allyship and inclusion within the industry? Uh, so we can go Temi, Tosin, and Clive, perhaps. Hi, um, and I'll try and make it quick. Um, I think for anyone wanting to be ally, I know this sounds weird, but I think the first thing you just need to understand is why are you doing it? Um, I think Clive already told us, I think um, because of your wife, she's kind of helped you to understand. And I think a lot of people kind of go about, especially senior people, senior privileged people go about doing it for the for the sake of doing it so that it can be seen doing it. And that doesn't come out, doesn't come out right in the relationship. So I think the first thing I would say is just understand why. Are you willing to listen? Are you willing for someone to be vulnerable to you on issues that you do not understand? Because I could come to you, I could come to someone, I could come to you, Clive, and say, oh, Clive, I need you to help me with this. I'm, I'm a black woman with kids. And these are just things that you might not, necessarily, you might not understand. But how do you listen and try to help me? So I think the first thing I would say is understand why you want to be an ally and be willing to listen in a quick nutshell. So I'll pass it over to Clive, I think. Yeah, we can go Clive, who has 60 seconds to answer. <laughs> <laughs> to, what can I cast do? Well, um, you know, it was, it was Ian who called me and mentioned that he wanted to do this uh, event and, and asked me if I was interested. And, you know, my, my default to all of these things is yes, unless there's a very good reason why it shouldn't be me. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that the Institute is focused on, on the broader, you know, uh, diversity, inclusion, equality. Um, it's, it, it's a journey that's, that's very clear. Uh, and personally, you know, as I hopefully look forward to becoming president of the Institute at some point next year, following in, in these fine uh, footsteps. Um, I'm very keen that we are actually sort of embracing a much broader population of, you know, student intake, potential student intakes, right? That their experience as students is, is positive and that they then be on, go, be, go on to be very sort of happy, you know, members of, of, of the Institute. And, and this is not the only piece of that complex puzzle, but it is an important piece of it. Okay, I'm going to ask you to in 45 yeah, seconds. But, it's, it's, it's yes, narrow. I can do that. It's it's for me to keep the communication line open, just like we have events like this. It's this is something I I, I think we can well ICAS can do more of, which uh, I think that's the intent in in any case. But having conversations like this, it helps to raise awareness. It helps people to ask questions, listen to senior leaders, listen to white uh, counterparts, black counterparts, Asian counterparts. Um, but that communication line is very key. Keep it open and continue to have sessions like this, you know, for members or even open to non-members as well. Okay, awesome. I think in that theme of kind of keeping communication lines open, this is a great, before I come to closing remarks, a great plug for something ICAS is looking to do to achieve just that. So um, we will be this year, ICAS launching a black members network, which supports kind of ICAS's broader diversity and inclusion objectives by creating an ecosystem where students and members identifying as black, um, and I choose those words carefully, identifying as black. So that's not precluding what we think we see when we look at someone. Uh, can kind of come together to collaborate, share ideas, personal and professional, which in turn can be sort of collected, bundled up and kind of fed back to ICAST to help shape and develop ICAST for the better. Um, if that's something that you are interested in, please email edi at icast.com to be involved, but alternatively, you can expect to hear from ICAST on this uh, sort of in the coming in the coming weeks. Um, I have been given a few other outtakes to, to mention, but in the interest of time and using my moderator privilege, I'm not going to do that. Um, all I would say is as a general wrap up is to please do visit kind of um, ICAST.com. 
for kind of where you can find more information on a lot of what's happening in ICAS. Please also look out for ICAS's publications, championing unique perspectives, which feature members who we would regard as future leaders, sharing their unique experiences as things we can all learn. So please look out for that. There's one live, I think at the moment uh, with Cole Agbidi. So please look out for that. And I think all that's left for me to do is to thank everyone for their participation. So thank you, Temi, Tosin, Clive. Thank you to everyone who's joined us this afternoon and has listened in and participated. And thank you also to our technicians beavering around in the background that no one else can see. Mm -hmm. uh, but I assure you, they played a, a really, a really vital role. So thank you, everyone, for being here today. And uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you.